The Joy of Motherhood by Bachi Emaki to 14 Women, alone after seven months had passed since the death of Nwakocha Ragbadi. People were beginning to wonder when Nuigo would go back to Lagos. Surrounded by in-laws, her own family and a close community, she knew that when the time came for her to leave Ibuza she was going to be very sorry. Yet she knew too, that she should not remain much longer. It was not that she did not wish to be there waiting for her husband, when he returned from taking part in the war. It was simply that she was reluctant to go back to a town, where conditions were so demanding. Life here might be unsophisticated, and money short, but she had few cares. One clear night, New Ego sat contentedly in front of the hut she had to herself, enjoying the cool of the evening. Her children and the other children of the household had been fed, and the noises they made in their moonlight games reached her now and again. Baby Amdio was in the willing hands of a Danquo, a strong woman in her early forties one of those wiry, dependable women whom people assumed would always be there. On being close to her one had the impression of a certain toughness, dry as twigs in talk as in appearance. She said little, though by contrast she laughed a great deal, displaying a set of magnificent teeth with a tantalizing gap in the middle. New Ego could hear Danko coming up to her, with little Namdio balanced astride one of her hips and holding a stool on the other side. Handing the boy over to his mother, Danko said, He has been chewing at my breasts all evening. I think he is just about ready for some real milk now. Oh, mother, Nuigo addressed her, in the way appropriate to the oldest woman of the Oelum family, you are not so old and dry. Let him suck more strongly, and I'm sure you two will start producing milk for him. I just want to lie here on this sand and gaze at the moon. My breastfeeding days are over, daughter. Get up and feed your son. He's very hungry. Also we must talk. Get up. There was an urgency in her voice, mingled with authority. I hope all is well in the household, Nuigo said with concern, rocking Namdio gently before putting him to her breast. Adankwo waited until Namdio was fully settled at his mother's breast before she spoke turning her head little to one side, as if afraid of an enemy listening to their words. She began rather abruptly, and from an angle, that seemed at first, to be unrelated to the topic no ego had thought she was going to broach. Who told you, that the dead are not with us? Who told you, that they do not see? A good person does not die and go forever. He goes to another world and may even decide to come back and live his life again. But must one not be good in this world to have that choice? Namdio gurgled noisily, lifting a plump foot in the air, and clutching at his mother's other breast proprietorially. Though the evening was quite bright, New Ego was glad it was not light enough, to reveal the alarm on her face. Her heart beat rapidly. Did the woman think that Naif might be dead? Had she received news of it from somebody? She told herself not to be foolish. Catastrophic news would not be imparted to her in this way. It would be done in a more theatrical way. She felt guilty at her own suspicions. One would think she wished her husband dead whereas, on the contrary, she'd dreaded that harm might come to him. If Adankwo had been glib of speech she might quickly have dissipated Nuigo's anxiety, but, apart from the fact that she was a woman of few words, she had an unfortunate way of allowing long silences between her utterances. You haven't answered my questions, she pointed out after a minute or so. I would give you an answer if I could, but I don't understand what you mean, Nuigo said. I mean your father. Adanko paused. Then she rapidly went on, like someone who had rehearsed, 
what she was going to say, being even exuberant in her exposition. You remember the night your father was dying, when he said he saw your mother. Remember he was telling Ona, who died long ago, that you had arrived from Lagos. Well, your father was a good man. He saw your mother, and he was going to the woman he loved, the woman he had missed all those years in death. But we all knew, that your father died in the actual sense of the word about five days before you arrived. I have heard this said many times, but how can it be possible? People die or should die gradually, familiarizing themselves with their loved ones on the other side step by step. Your father, however, kept coming back, waiting for you. He kept asking people, what will I tell my owner, if she asks me, how our only daughter is? How could I tell her, that I have not seen our child for the past ten years? No, I must see her. I must hang on. And he lay there suffering in silence. Would it then be right for you to offend such a father? Offend him? But how am I offending him? Well, I'll tell you one thing. You're not doing him justice, by backing away from the responsibility he entrusted you with. He knew your roots are deep here, that was why he promised to come back to you, yes. I was there in the shadows of the courtyard. We all heard every word. But what responsibility did he leave me, that I have neglected? Quote, don't you see, new ego, daughter of Agbadi? Can't you see, that you are running away from the position your Kai has given you, and leaving it for a woman your husband inherited from his brother, a woman whom we here all know to be very ambitious? a woman who has not even borne a son for this family. And you, you have deep roots. Dot. What do you think you are doing? You want to walk with land? You cannot. You have rooted in the Solem family. You are the senior wife of your husband. You are like a male friend to him. Your place is at his side, to supervise his younger wife. Have you ever heard of a complete woman without a husband? You have done your duty to your father, a man with such an ability of spirit it defied explanation. Now it is to your husband that you should go. But, Nui Go began to protest. He is still fighting in the war. I have not neglected him as such. Suppose he has hurried home to see you, to see the new man-child you have borne him? only to be met by a Daku and her wines and ambitions. Do you think that clever thing would put in a good word for you? Naif would jump to the conclusion, that as soon as he left you preferred to go to your people. I haven't stayed with my people, everybody knows that. I stayed here with his family. That is true, my daughter, but are you there to tell him so? Suppose a Daku took all the gifts he brought from overseas, including money. Don't forget that she is desperate for a son and you have three already. You should be there to see that, whatever he brings back is not wasted. You are the mother of the men children, that made him into a man. If a Daku dies today, her people, not her husband's, will come for her body. It is not so with you. What do you think I should do with Oshia? He has settled down so well to being a farmer as well as a schoolboy. He loves the life here. That is true, replied Adanko, thoughtfully. But there is something new coming to our land. Have you noticed it? We as a family don't all have to live and be brought up in the same place. Let him be trained in Lagos where he was born. He will be able to bring that culture back here to enrich our own. In a few years, he will be able to start looking after you materially. Oshia is now ten. My sons were bringing in their own yams at the age of fifteen. So you don't have long to wait. She paused as if to gather her thoughts. But I would have failed as a mother if I hadn't been here to see, 
that their lands were secure, otherwise where would my sons have built their huts? You buried your father seven months ago. That is a long enough time. You must go back and save your children's inheritance. We haven't got much in Lagos that we can call our own, though. I had to scrape and make do all the time. Even the room we live in is rented. How do you know what you might acquire in the future? How do you know what Naif will be bringing back from the war? Things will go well with him, because I have made many sacrifices for his protection. I don't want all to go to that ambitious young woman Adaku. I know her. She was my husband's last wife. Dot so you must start getting ready tomorrow. And if you are ever in a bad patch with the boys' education, don't forget that girls grow very quickly. The twins' bride prices will help out. But Naif would be back by then. Go, and save your son's inheritance. When she arrived back in Lagos, Nuigo could not believe her eyes. It was as if she had been away nine years, not months. Things had become doubly expensive, and this annoyed her a great deal. Their rent had gone up to seven shillings a month, a measure of Gary cost twice what it used to, some common foodstuffs were quite unavailable, and to her dismay she found that her Danko was right about to Daku. Naif had been back on a short visit only three weeks before. But why didn't you send a message home? Nuigo asked aggrievedly. We would have rushed back to see him. I would have liked to show him his new son. He didn't stay long, senior wife. He was happy that you were an abuser, as that was saving him money. He left you five pounds. I was going to send it to you, as soon as I knew of anyone going home. But as you can see I've been very busy. Yes, I can see you have been busy making money. Look at all your wares, look at your stalls. I'm sure Naif's money went into building your trade. That is not true, senior wife. I didn't ask you to go home in the first place. You insisted on it, so don't blame me if you've lost your foothold in Lagos. Here is your five pounds. I didn't use it for my business, as you seem to think. See that you are laughing at me. Yes, Adaku, you can afford to make fun of me. You may think you are right, but I am telling you that you are wrong. Whereas you chose money or nice clothes, I have chosen my children. But you must remember that wealth has always been in my family. I am poor only in Lagos. Go to abusers and see how rich I am in people, friends, relatives, in-laws. I don't know what you want me to do, senior wife. There's nothing to stop you going back to your stalls in front of the house, your cigarette stalls. Dot. Adaku added with a suppressed giggle, knowing perfectly well that neighbors had taken advantage of Nuigo's absence and ruin that business for her. There were four other wooden kiosks, where previously hers had been alone. One of the landlord's wives had even started selling things in front of the house. Knowing she could not compete, New Ego was at her wit's end. To get a market stall was out of the question. It had become so costly that if she paid for one with the little money left there would be nothing to spend on stocking the stall. So she took up selling firewood. This did not require much capital. Simply a great deal of energy. One had to carry the wood from the waterside, break it into pieces with an axe, and then tie the pieces together into bundles for sale. Many other women found it too tiring. Though Nuigo tried to go back to all of the meeting together, herself and her children with Adaku and her two girls, as before, she saw that it would no longer work. Adaku was now very rich. She had only two daughters to feed. She talked of sending them to private lessons to learn their alphabet, 
though she had not actually done so yet, nor were they attending any school. A deck whose stall in Zabo Market was stacked high with beans, pepper, dried fish, egg goosey and spicy foodstuffs. She would stay away all day at market, coming in late at night, so there was no point in Nuigo waiting for her. Nor did Adaku herself ask for food when she came back, so presumably she and her children ate in the market. This was life Nuigo did not know how to cope with. She felt adrift, as it were on an open sea. No physical help came from friends, for they were all too busy making their own money, and she was always tied down at home with Nandio and the twins. She paid few visits to people not wanting them to think she came to their houses for food. She stopped going to most of the family meetings. One needed to be in fashion to keep in touch. Adaku would attend the gatherings, and come and report back to her what had been discussed. Nuigo accepted her lot, taking comfort in the fact that one day her boys would be men. But to be so reduced in status as to be almost a maid to a junior wife, and an inherited junior wife at that, dampened her spirit. When Naif had gone to Fun and Opo at least she had been by herself. It was one thing to be poor, it was another to be seen to be poor. If only, if only Adaku had taken herself somewhere else or, nor could we go go back to abusers, not after the talk Adanquo had given her. Apart from the fact that she would look ridiculous, she would be regarded as an ungrateful person, disregarding the heart-to-heart -heart talk from a Danquo who was known for her taciturnity. No, she decided, she would have to grit her teeth, and carry on as bravely as possible. Everything would be just fine, when the children grew up. New Ego was like those not-so-well-informed Christians who, promised the kingdom of heaven, believed that it was literally just round the corner, and that Jesus Christ was coming on the very morrow. Many of them would hardly contribute anything to this world, reasoning, and what is the use? Christ will come soon. They became so insulated in their beliefs, that not only would they have little to do with ordinary sinners, people going about their daily work, they even pitied them, and in many cases looked down on them, because the kingdom of God was not for the likes of them. Maybe this was a protective mechanism devised to save them from realities too painful to accept. As the months passed, new ego began to act in this way. She did everything she could to make a Daku jealous of her sons. She looked for every opportunity to call the names of her children in full, telling herself she was having her own back. Mina quarrels started between the two women, and Yabani, Nwakasa and their other friends were usually called in to settle the disputes. It was June and very wet. The amount of rain that fell at that time of year took some getting used to. It came so unexpectedly that day that Nuigo was annoyed. True, there had been the thick clouds heralding the rain's arrival, but they had appeared so suddenly that, before she was able to adjust her plans for later that afternoon it started to pour with torrents of water being released. She had been up early, and had enough firewood for the rest of the week. She calculated that she would have enough for her own cooking, and still be able to make a little profit selling the rest enough to buy the children beans for breakfast. She and the babies would sit outside beside the bread, and other groceries she sold at her kiosk in front of the house. Oshia would go and hawk soap, cigarettes, matches and candles, while his brother Adim would sell the roasted ground nuts she was preparing. She was just emerging from the kitchen with the steaming ground nuts when the rain started. Now what was she going to do? If they would kept today the ground nuts would lose their freshness, and she would not dream of sending Oshia out in this weather. People who knew she sold firewood might come in to ask for some, 
but still she was going to lose a great deal of profit on account of this rain. With her desperate financial situation she could not afford to lose even half a day's custom. She paced up and down the narrow gap between the beds in the room. She could hear the shrieks of delight from the children as they ran in and out of the rain, enjoying its coolness after the oppressive heat that invariably preceded such downpours. What am I going to do, she murmured, near tears. All I have is the five pounds Mamma Abbey advised me to save two years ago. If I use that now, how will Oshia continue his schooling, and what will happen to a dim? Little Namdio is growing. To, oh, this war, this war. Dot. Nobody tells you anything. No one knows when Aphis. Maybe in India, maybe in heaven, or even in the north of Nigeria. How do I know? Mother, mother, shouted Taywo, one of her twin girls. There is a visitor. Come, mother. She wants to come in. A visitor in this weather. The child must have got it wrong. Who in their right senses would be calling on her now? All the same, she might as well go and see for herself. Outside the door stood a woman from Mibuza, Igbenoba's wife. She was related to Adaku, and like Adaku was doing very well in her business. This woman had the added good fortune to marry an old man who had not qualified to be sent to war and her husband was one of Ibuza's fairly prosperous people. What was more, this woman, unlike Adaku, had many children, boys as well as girls in short she had everything any woman could want. And look at her, New Ego thought angrily, look at the expensive shoes she is wearing, look at that head tie, and even a gold chain all this, just to come and see her relative Adaku, and in this rain. God, the cost of that head tie. Whatever she paid for it would feed me, and the children for a whole month. And she is the daughter of a nobody. Yet look at me, the daughter of a well-known chief, reduced to this. Dot. The rain is very heavy won't you ask me to come in? Your veranda is blocked up with firewood and your kiosk, Igbenoba's wife said, half in joke and half in anger. Her eyes were following New Ego's, and she was able partially to guess her thoughts. Adaku had said she would be home early that day. Maybe the rain had detained her. Egbenoba's wife intended to wait for her. New Ego was still staring at her with glazed eyes. So people still lived ostentatiously like this. Yes, she had seen things in the market like this colorful umbrella. Those she had never thought they could be within the means of abuser women. Oh, what had she done to deserve being punished like this? She could not stand it. No, she could not. She felt like screaming, but she covered her mouth tightly with her hand. Well, if you're going to stand there and stare at me, I'll just step into your veranda and wait for my cousin Adaku. The woman mounted the two cement steps, and looked round for a chair. There was none. So she started to shake the water from her expensive outfit. New Ego watched her, her mouth still covered, her body shaking. The woman looked up and asked, Are you all right, Naif's wife? Why do you look at me like that? I am not your enemy, eh? Why are you looking at me like that? as if you don't want to see me. I have come all the way from Oberland, the other side of Lagos Island, and there was no word of welcome from you quote shut up. Shut up and go away. You can't stand here. My baby is crying go away. New Ego's voice was so loud, that it was more thunderous than the rain. Come in, children, it's raining. The little ones came in and we go bang the door shut. Egbenoba's wife opened and shut her mouth in wonder. She had never in all her life seen such antisocial behavior. She had never been so insulted. 
What was the matter with the woman? She acted as if her nerves were taut, and almost at breaking point. To shout back at Nuigo would be pointless. The rain was howling its protest anyway, and her voice would only be drowned like everything else. If her husband Igbenoba was told this, he would raise hell. As she was struggling to recover from her shock, she heard Nuigo and the children singing with forced happiness, and thought, Thank goodness I have my own children, otherwise I would jump to the conclusion she was putting on this show of motherhood to make me jealous. She stood there, waiting both for the rain, to lessen and for Adaku, whom she knew, would be worried about her. Meanwhile Adaku grew tired of waiting for the rain to stop, for it seemed determined to go on all afternoon. She and her two little girls chose to brave it, and, with an old army tarpaulin they had picked up in the market serving as protection, they ran home. Egbenoba's wife's eyes were still fixed on the slam door, when she heard the footsteps of Adaku and her two laughing daughters. They were soaked to the skin, because the tarpaulin was only large enough to partly cover their heads. I knew you'd be here waiting for me, panted Adaku as they jumped onto the veranda. That's why we had to brave it. It's so heavy, this rain, that it gives one a headache. I know, replied her cousin. Some of the drops hit you like small pebbles, and the suddenness of it. I thought it had to stop soon, since it started almost unannounced. Well, we are all here safe and sound, said Adaku. Welcome. I can see that you have just arrived too. I would hate myself if you had had to wait long. Anyway, my senior is inside. Can you hear her singing? She is so devoted to her children. This was said with a conspiratorial wink. Adaku opened the door and they all squeezed into the little space of the room. Nuigo welcomed them mildly, and Igbenoba's wife noted that she behaved as though everything was perfectly above board. Should she or should she not let Adaku know what had happened? She decided against it. It would cause nothing but trouble, and she would be called to be a witness. She did not relish, she thought. Few things are as bad as a guilty conscience. Nuigo sanded round their amused visitor, pretending she had not met her before, and brought out some cola nut with which to serve her. Adaku wondered little at her behavior, for her co-wife normally showed only minimal interest in her visitors. She must like Igbenoba's wife very much, Adaku concluded. New ego averted her eyes, but Igbenoba's wife knew that her actions were begging her, appealing to her for forgiveness. The visitor was sorry for her. Fancy a senior wife lowering herself to such a level. But she said nothing. New ego realized that socially she had carried her obsession a bit too far. She could only hope this woman would not repeat the story to anybody. Adaku, however, heard of it three days later, not from Midbenoba's wife nor from Nuigo, but from her son little Adim. Adaku was too incensed to say a word to Nuigo. She simply dashed out to summon her kinsman Waluza, the man who had rescued Nuigo from death many years before, and she also invited their good friend Yabani. The case was stated to them. But instead of laying the whole blame on Nuigo, they made Adaku feel that, since she had no son for the family she had no right to complain about her senior's conduct. Don't you know that according to the custom of our people you, Adaku, the daughter of whoever you are, are committing an unforgivable sin? Nwakas reminded her. Our life starts from immortality and ends in immortality. If Naif had been married to only you, you would have ended his life on this round of his visiting earth. I know you have children, but they are girls, who in a few years time will go, and help build another man's immortality. 
the only woman who is immortalizing your husband you may come happy with your fine clothes and lucrative business. If I were in your shoes, I should go home and consult my Kai, to find out why male offspring have been denied me. But instead, here you are quarreling about your visitor. Why did she have to dress up so extravagantly, anyway, and during the week for that matter? Though abuser men admired a hard-working and rich woman, her life was nothing. If she left no male children behind when she had gone to inherit the wealth, children who were her own flesh and blood. What was the point of piling up wealth, when there was nobody to leave it for? Nwakasa had a word of caution for no ego. She must guard her reputation. Children were all very well, but they would only enjoy and glory in their parents, if those parents had made sure to leave a good, clean name behind them. She should never let it be repeated that the daughter of Nwakocha Ragbadi by his eternal sweetheart owner did not know the art of courtesy to a visitor. Don't you realize that the house belongs to you, so why should you feel reluctant to welcome a caller, and an abuser woman for that matter? Nwaka Sir asked. Nuigo could not say that it was because the woman looked so well off, and because Adaku had been parading her own wealth ever since Nuigo arrived back from Mibusa. So she kept quiet, only murmuring. This Lagos. It makes me forget my position sometimes. It will not happen again, I promise. Well, you must pay a fine of a keg of palm wine and a tin of cigarettes. Adaku stood looking on and saw that she was completely ignored. They did not ask Nuigo to apologize to her, and for a time it looked as if they had even forgotten it had been she who invited them to settle the case in the first place. The message was clear. She was only a lodger, her position in Nafo Alam's household had not been ratified. Nor did the fact that she was making a lot of money particularly endear her to them. She got the message. As soon as the men went, New Ego crawled into her bed, which she had now covered with hand spun mats as she had no money for bed sheets. Her feelings were mixed, and she wanted to weep for what she did not know. She felt sorry for Adaku, and the men's hurtful treatment of her, but would Adaku understand, if she should tell her so? She also felt relief, knowing that her own fate could so easily have been like Adaku's. Yet all because she was the mother of three sons, she was supposed to be happy in her poverty, in her nail-biting agony, in her churning stomach, in her eggs in her cramped room. Dot. Oh, it was a confusing world. As pangs of hunger gripped the sides of her stomach she shifted slightly, hoping by so doing to lessen her urge to consume a horse. She had eaten very little since morning. The peacemakers had left her a couple of pennies a fraction of what it cost her to pay her fine of palm wine and cigarettes which she was keeping to buy the boys a decent breakfast, before they went to school in the morning. She heard Adaku sniffing. So close were their beds, that even though they were separated by a curtain one could hear the person in the other bed breathe. New Ego was overwhelmed with pity for Adaku, but how could she express it? The men had been unfair in their judgment. She, knew Ego, had been wrong all the way, but of course they had made it seem that she was innocent, just because she was the mother of sons. Men were so clever. By admonishing her, and advising her to live up to her status as senior wife, they made it sound such an enviable position, worth any woman's while to fight for. She did not care. She spoke to Adaku. I am sorry. Maybe you should not have called the men. There was a short silence, and then Adaku said, I am glad I did. I've got what I asked for, suppose. They have told me what you have been trying to tell me since you returned from Medusa. 
I'm thankful to them for doing it. Then what are you going to do, Adaku? What you have been wanting me to do? Leave this stinking room. Why should I put up with all this any longer? Naif does not want me, nor did his people, so why stay? When he came back on leave, he was angry with me for your going home to bury your father. He was hurt to think that you rated your father higher than him, and as for me, he accused me of not stopping you. So he came to my bed only as a second choice. I didn't mind, because all I wanted from him was a male child. But I didn't get pregnant. And you came back only a few days afterwards with so many children of his. I could hardly bear it. And now these men come this evening to rub it all in, as if I didn't know already. She sighed. Everybody accuses me of making money all the time. What else is there for me to do? I will spend the money I have in giving my girls a good start in life. They shall stop going to the market with me. I shall see that they get enrolled in a good school. I think that will benefit them in the future. Many rich Yoruba families send their daughters to school these days. I shall do the same with mine. Naif is not going to send them away to any husband before they are ready. I will see to that. I'm leaving this stuffy room tomorrow, senior wife, to go and worship your Kai. My Kai be damned. I'm going to be a prostitute. Damn my Kai. Quote she added again fiercely. New Ego could not believe her ears. Do you know what you are saying, Adaku? The Kai, your personal god, that gave you life quote I don't care for the life he or she gave me. I'm leaving here tomorrow with my girls. I am not going to abuse her. I am going to live with those women in Montgomery Road. Yes, I'm going to join them, to make some of our men who return from the fighting happy. Stop. Stop. New Ego shouted. Don't forget that we have young girls sleeping in this room, and don't you dare insult me by saying such things in my hearing. Which women are you talking about? You surely can't mean you are going to be that kind of woman, question mark you can't. What of your daughters? No abuser man will marry girls brought up by a prostitute. I am sorry, if I insulted you, but you asked me, remember. As for my daughters, they will have to take their own chances in this world. I am not prepared to stay here, and be turned into a madwoman, just because I have no sons. The way they go on about it one would think I know where sons are made, and have been neglectful about taking one for my husband. One would think I'd never had one before. People forget that. Well. If my daughters can't forgive me when they grow up, that will be too bad. I'm going to be thrown away when I'm dead, in any case, whereas people like you, senior wife, have formed roots, as they say. You will be properly buried in Naif's compound. New Ego was silent. Should she blame herself? Had she driven a Daku to take this step? No. It must always have been in the woman, to make this sort of move. Even a Danquo in abusers, had warned of Odaku's ambitiousness. She could stay until Naif returned, if she wanted to. New Ego sighed sadly. I think you are making a mistake, Odaku. Besides you could have a son when a husband returns. Maybe you're right again, my senior. Yet the more I think about it the more I realize that we women set impossible standards for ourselves. That we make life intolerable for one another. I cannot live up to your standards, senior wife. So I have to set my own. May your Kai be your guide. Adaku, new ego whispered almost inaudibly as she crawled further into the urine-stained mats on her bar-ridden bed enjoying the knowledge of her motherhood.